Frank, how are you? Uh, are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. How you doing? I can see you. Appreciate you taking the time. We're excited to talk to you. We're uh, everybody at the hundreds is really excited about this collab. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I still gotta I still gotta like walk the box of prints over to the post office and get them back to you guys. I'll do that this week. It's just that uh, I don't have a car out here, so I'm kind of stuck out in the countryside. Where are you? I'm up in Marin. I have a house up in Marin, so instead of staying in town, I decided to stay up here for the play. Yeah, so I got a pool, so it's nicer. That is nice. That's the place to be stuck. Um, tell us a little bit about the room. It looks like you're in your studio. Um, yeah, I have like a just my office here. Some cool sculpture room, room in the house downstairs. Pretty um, big house, so I have this room. I have an archive room. So I just, I work from home these days. What have you been working on? Well, you know, I run Kid Robot, so just. That's, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. Then I make toys with Black Book Toy in Japan. So work on that stuff, do stuff in China. Uh, I did your thing. I'm doing uh, some other collabs uh, right now that are kind of NDAs. Uh, it's weird since the, since the clampdown, I've had like more work than ever. So, you know, I'm doing all right. That's, that's kind of what we found too is, uh... And I don't know if it's just a, a factor of, of people being home and just like online shopping and consuming content more, but things when we when we thought things might slow down, things really heated up. It's kind of so, crazy. you know, and then all the people that worked for me at Kid Robot, I sent them all remote, so they're all happy, they're all being productive. So it's kind of like my world is like it's not a big problem. And I saw, so uh, I saw you guys did the, the red rum, shining labbit. You got visitors? <laughs> Something really weird just happened outside. Okay, that's bizarre. Why did that happen? Um, yeah. I saw you guys did the uh, the Shining Red Room lab. That was tight. We were like right in the middle of our Kubrick collab. Um, so I've been like. So, so are you doing that with like, like um, Warner Brothers or from the book? Or are you doing it with Christina Kubrick? How does that work for you guys? We're working with the Kubrick estate. Um, we that's have, okay, that's right. Yeah, because we worked with them a couple of years ago on 2001 A Space Odyssey, and that did really well. So they approached us again about doing a few more properties. So we did uh, The Shining, Full Metal, and Clockwork comes out actually later tonight. Um, so what did you guys do for that? Just clothing or...? Full a full collection for each movie. So full printables, cut and sew. Um, we haven't announced it yet, but we have some. Uh, like basically, we we did three straight weeks of a drop for each movie, and then we're gonna do on the fourth week we're dropping a skateboard deck for each movie. Um, yeah, they came out. We did f the full cut and sew for each one was crazy. Like. The Shining, there was like a, a long sleeve that looked like it had been dipped in blood halfway, like from that river scene, Full Metal, we did the vest. Um, the clockwork stuff, we did like a, a quilted bomber jacket that kind of looks like the straight jacket. Um, so it was all really, really well done. People seemed to really like it. I was stoked on it. Um, yeah. But like rewatching, rewatching those movies, especially now, like rewatching The Shining during a quarantine is crazy. And then, Stay re yeah, and then rewatching um, Clockwork while there's like riots going on was also very weird. And it's it's just kind of crazy that Kubrick, you know, you watch some old movies and they feel so dated, but Kubrick somehow, fifty years later finds a way to like twist in your brain and make everything relevant and and he yeah. still he's a he's smart motherfucker man crazy insane and it's yeah those those movies are timeless so i was stoked to see you got you did a a shining toy too that's sick um so i want to get right into it we we have a collab coming out um and it focuses on um you know a lot of the art style you used to do with concert posters. 
Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about concert posters and kind of that 90s aesthetic sure. and a lot of the colors you use and a lot of the bold, like, in-your-face design style. Um, sure. How did you get into that? Well, so the way this started is back in, like, I'd say between, like, 1979 and 1981. Uh, I was in the military, and it was, you know, kind of boring. Uh, and I was down in like Mississippi and then, and then I got stationed to Austin, which was like an awesome thing. And just sort of like Austin, which is sort of get, getting into it's like punk rock renaissance. Um, so my situation was a small, small base. I got paid extra to live downtown. First night out, saw a guy with green hair. Uh, and I did listening to, to music, you know, I started listening to stuff around 79 or so. And, um, and I'll, but I'd never seen like a punk rocker, right? And I was like, fuck, that's a punk rock dude. So I was like, dude, where do you punk out? He's like, follow me. His name was Billy Pringle. And uh, he took me to this place called Club Foot, which was in that those days in Austin, it was behind the old Greyhound station on Congress Avenue and sort of legendary punk rock new wave club. Kind of a scene where everybody was welcome, like every kind of freak went there. So I was like, okay, this is awesome. So I started going to like shows as much as I could, met people and Deliver, uh, I met this guy called Billy Pringle or uh, Billy Haddock, and he was in this thing called the Art Magus, which is sort of like an like a art collective. And back then, we did we did mail art where you would sort of like correspond with weird people all around the world. And this is sort of like pre fanzine, pre street art. So you would just make weird shit and mail it to somebody. So I was corresponding with like uh, the throbbing gristle people and this guy al ackerman in seattle and these art maggot people in portland and there was this crazy dude in northern ireland that his thing is like whenever there was like a an army shooting you know during the during the rock this shit up there he would go and collect like shell casings and dirt from the site and make little little souvenir packs and mail them to you like greetings from belfast right so it was like this whole sort of weird like like you know art scene where he would just mail weird shit to each other and then that kind of turned into some of those people started bands or started doing fanzines or whatever in the early 80s. So I was working with those people and in Austin and we would just do weird shit like just make up weird nonsense flyers and put them on telephone poles, right? And then we did like a calendar. And at some point, like a local like new wave cover band was like, will you do like a flyer for us? Well, okay, sure. So I started doing little black and white Xerox flyers for local bands. And, you know, I would go to Kinko's. I had, a, I'd say I had like, somehow stolen or gotten a, a card to run the Xerox machine, right? Like an employee card. So I'd go in there and run off, like, 50 flyers for free. You know, that kind of stuff. Go around town and put them up. And then, um, so that became a cool thing. And then I started working. And then I got out of the military. And I started working, like, at clubs. This is, like, the early 80s. And there was a guy called Brad First. He was a really interesting guy from Austin. He owned a, a, a string of punk rock clubs. Um, he owned the Cave Club. He owned the Cavern Club. He owned Club Foot. Not Club Foot. Um, he owned the, the Cave Club over on 6th Street. And so his, his last club was really big. And he was really, he was like a weird stoner guy. And he was really into posters and flyers. So I was working for him. And he, was, he would actually pay me and pay for the printing of to do posters. So I started doing posters with this guy. And then Austin had one of the first alternative weekly newspapers, the, or the old Chronicle, okay? And so the first year out, the Chronicle had, you know, best of, right? They invented that thing. And like, I won the, the best poster thing. And on the strength of that, I went and got a job at a silkscreen place, learned how to silkscreen shirts and posters, ended up buying my own silkscreen press, right? And printing big posters, which nobody could do, right? So I was like, okay, this is cool. I can be a total asshole. Like I can do posters for like these local bands that are like gig enormous and in like really colorful. So it was just the big format, colorful silkscreen posters was a result of me just being a total show off, right? Because people are like, how can you do this? And I had figured out this deal where the band would let me sell some to pay for the run and everybody was happy, right? Like nobody had to pay for it. Um, at the same time, you know, Austin was this place in the middle of America where it's like, you know, it was 1986 or 87 and you were touring in a band 
um, there's no place to stop and play in middle America that was safe, right? Like you go East Coast, maybe New Orleans, and then there's like nothing until you get to California. So kind of like, and this started back in the 60s, like sort of every kind of like weird band, because Austin was really liberal, because it has a liberal history going back to the 19th century, could stop in Austin, get a gig, have a place to crash in the middle of this long journey across like middle America. So I met and did flyers and posters for all these bands on their first tours before they got big and famous. And then when they got big and famous, they're like, hey dude, will you do a poster for us here? Will you do a poster, you know what I'm saying? So it was this total just organic thing where I was in the right place at the right time. You know, I did the something for Sonic Youth's first tour and all the Butthole Surfer stuff and the Chili Peppers first tours and Nirvana's first tour and like you name it, you know. Any, any sort of underground punk or new wave band, I was there at the little show on the first tour met them because I worked at the club or I did the poster for the club and like, like, you know, knew all those people. And so it was kind of like, you know, it's not what you do, it's who you know, right? And then when I could produce these great big giant posters, then bands and labels from all over the country want stuff. Because it was a great deal because I could get them, a, give them a $10,000 print job for free if they would let me sell like a, a run of them, right? So it just became this DIY deal and it, it grew and grew and grew and got really big. I got national press, turned that into a record label, right? In the nineties, record label did really good. You know, we did all that stoner rock shit first and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then because of the posters, I started going to Japan to do poster shows and art shows and crap, right? And like in the late nineties, I was in Japan and I knew all these dudes that were like in the Harajuku area that had like the little clothing labels and shit. So like, I met, you know, like Hiroshi Fujiwara, right? And, and Nigo and Electric Neighborhood and, and fucking uh, Junio and all those, you know, like original wave of Japanese streetwear guys when they were first starting out. And I was friends with the dudes that were behind them, giving them the push, right? Their mentor guys were my age. Those guys had been big in the 80s and 70s. There's this whole secret world of Japanese streetwear that nobody in the States knows about how it, it's generational. Um, and a lot of those guys knew about my posters. Now, what they were doing there, and it started with the guys that had like an electric cottage in the neighborhood, like they all purse and the bounty hunter guy, they all collected like American advertising mascots. Okay. And so they wanted to do like a weird retro mascot for their clothing line. So the guy at Neighborhood, Electric Cottage, did these like cartoon dogs, right? And Bounty Hunter did the weird Captain Crunch kid. And then people would come to the stores and they'd be like, well, fuck your clothes. I want to buy that thing, right? And they're like, oh, there's a market here, right? At the same time, this guy Takashita did like a rap thing looking thing. So right around 98, 97, 98, 99, all these dudes that had streetwear brands started making these toys. Okay, it became a thing. Then the guy that owns Medicom came along, right? Blew it up. And I was in the right place at the right time in Japan. So I started doing shit for Medicom. And I did a, my, my first toy release was with Bounty Hunter, like 1998, 99. Then I did stuff for Medicom for a few years. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm really into this. And then I would bring it back to the States and nobody cared, right? I did a show at La Luz that was all bare, my big bear bricks and like bear brick paintings, and all this shit. And everybody was like, dude, like, are you gay now? Like, what the fuck happened to you? Right? Like, where's your cool rock shit, man? I'm like, no, dude, this is way cooler. I like this way better. <clears throat> so I just stuck with it. And then, uh, Budnitz, a kid robot, I was buying shit off his website. He started off just having a retail site, importing stuff and selling it. Like, he got, he got some funding. He went into business making toys. He, figured out who I was. He called me. He's like, you want to make a toy? I'm like, bro, I'm ready. Right. This is like 2003, 2004. And then it worked, right? Like the toy thing became super hip for a while. It got a lot of hype. It blew up, you know, it, you know, cause did really well with it. He turned it into a fine art career, you know, like I've done really well with it. And like, I still sell a ton of toys. Plus I run a couple of companies for other dudes that make toys. Right. Um, and it's interesting because I've done more toy projects and made way more money off that than like the 20, you know, the whatever, 18 years of music stuff. So it was kind of like I did all music related shit till about 
2000, 2001. Then I switched over to doing the toy kind of stuff. And I've done stuff like your releases throughout, right? I've always done like other kinds of things. But what's interesting is that when I was doing music work, it's always a sideways move. It's like, oh, you do posters, you do music stuff. So the only jobs you're fucking offered are like more posters or album covers or whatever, right? The minute I made a product that was three dimensional, it came in a box and sold in a store. Everyone's like, oh, you're a designer. So like, I totally got to jack my rates, right? And got started getting offering like, you wanna do a couch, you wanna do a lamp, you wanna do a, you know, these toys, you wanna, you wanna design a restaurant interior, do you wanna make a thing, you know? And I'm like, yeah, of course, right? I wanna do all that shit, because that shit's fucking interesting to do. Yeah. So that's kind of like the weird 30 year cycle, right? I mean, I did a lot of fine art in the 90s, I sold the fuck out of it, there was a big low brown scene in LA, you know, I did tons of shows at La Luz in the soap plant back in the day. Crazy shows. Everyone would show up. The dwarves would play. Marilyn Manson would come. They would all spend money and all that shit. Those days are kind of over now, right? Yeah. You know, that was fun, but it's like you can't base your life on something like that. That was just like hype of the moment. Um, the toy thing, though, it's like it's stable. It's a, it's a niche market. Everybody wants it. It's it's slowly going mainstream, which is fine for me because now I make my own weird shit in Japan, low runs, but like like the pig thing that you guys are getting. But you know, I'm running Kid Robot and we're doing like mainstream toys now. So it's kind of like, and it's you know financially successful. I have a really cool collaboration coming out with uh, Mattel soon. Um, so it's been, everything's by accident. So like I say, started off with a 10 speed and a stolen Kinko's card and uh, I turned it into a career, you know, that's kind of like the, the short version, if that makes any sense. The transitions and, and just like taking opportunities as they come and, and crushing it is. Yeah. Cause you know, I know a lot of older creative dudes, man. And it's like, they get famous for like this one thing and then they're like, okay, I'm going to milk this forever. And they just like, dude, how stale is your fucking life? Right. Yeah, and you like, probably I don't want to keep doing the same fucking thing forever. Like I always want to try new shit, you know. Yeah, because um, the old stuff does come back around, and it's just like another tool you have. And if you, you know, have awesome, multiple, right? if you have multiple outlets, you don't start hating this one thing that you've been working on forever, and you have you know different different. No, I did. You know, fine arts, fuck, dude. I did like a, maybe a hundred fine art pieces, paintings, and sculptures, and I sold every one of them. But like, if you do the math, you're making like less than minimum wage. You know, right. and, yeah. You know, for my what I could get for some piece, like I get like twenty grand for something, right? Oh, it seems like a lot of money, but then you go, okay, you know, got a thousand hours into it. How much? You, and then the gallery's taking a cut, and I got to ship it, and I got to buy the materials. End of the day, like you're fucking yourself. So yeah, you know, the first couple of shows, oh, I'm fucking rad, you know, I'm gonna fuck that chick and you know, all this kind of stuff, right? And I'm famous, but then after a while, you're like, okay, I can't pay the bills and all my shit sells, like what's the issue here, right? Very few guys are lucky enough to ramp up to that price point. And they're usually guys that can like work that system, you know, those rich fuck people and you know, it's not, not my scene really. So it's like, I never, I never wanted to invest the sort of energy I would have to invest into fine art to make it successful for me financially, right? Plus, you know, dude, I'll be real honest. Like, I don't have a message. There's no big message here. It's like, I just geek on shit that happens around me and like do my version of it. You know, I'm like, oh, that looks cool. Like I do stuff because I think it looks cool, not because there's some, you know, I have a big statement about the nature of humanity or whatever the fuck, right? So. We all we all think it looks cool too, and I and you know growing up, I'm I'm a kid when all these albums are coming out, and I'm seeing all this imagery in the night. It was a fun time. Yeah, like some of these posters and um, what was it like to to you know the posters obviously are, are a more localized thing that to promote. I life. lived a life. I mean, it was like my life then was. Uh, I think about it now. It's kind of like whoa. You know, I got to live in a fantasy world for like ten years in Austin. You know, thirteen years. It's like basically, I you know, Austin was cheap, so I had like a really chill house. Right, I didn't have to work. I would like you know, or if I worked, it was like fun, right? Because I you know worked at the club or whatever, you know, and so so I would just I would go to punk rock or metal shows every single night okay 
So it was like really cool bands every night, you know, like a million girls, because Austin was like a liberal college town. So like every year, you know, a million girls would show up, knew everybody, life was cheap. I did, you know, so I would like, what was my life? I would go stay up till like three in the morning, go to a show, come home, wake up at noon, work on a poster, get paid, go eat and go back to another show, right? For fucking 13 years, it was awesome. Like all I did was, I wasn't like a big partier, but I just totally just like lived like a kid, like a child. Like I just lived like this sort of fantasy life for a super long time. And there was a lot of crazy energy, right? In Austin at that time. And, you know, it was the perfect time and place for what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was make the posters. And I just lived in this like sort of like world of pleasure, you know? Uh, and then, you know, it kind of started, Austin got really big and it got expensive and it dwindled, everything dwindled away. And, you know, people get older and I started like, going, okay, I'm turning into the weird old guy that hangs around the school, you know, basically, right? You know, and I, I don't have any clothes and I don't have a bank account. And I don't have a driver's license. And like, I just, you know, shuffle around like this deranged hobo or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like a little bit too much slack. And so I came out to, the, to San Francisco to do a deal for a book with Last Gasp. And it was like a nice day in the mission. And, you know, Ron, Ron Turner handed me like a big wad of cash book advance and he had just fixed up these like workspaces over on Florida street. And he was like, yeah, you gotta move out of here. I'm gonna show one of these spaces. And I was like, okay, cool. And I gave him back some money, right? Went back, packed up my shit, came to San Francisco in time to find out it really sucked. Cause like I get, came out and it rained for two months straight and like everybody was like, hey, oh, shit, right? But you know, I stuck it out and built up the poster business out here, started the label, you know, did a big job for Nike, got a lot of money, used that money to start the record label you know, did the record label for whatever, six years or whatever. And it was really successful. And then uh, Sony pulling out of distribution destroyed everything in 2001. Every, everybody got fucked in distribution, like collapsing distribution deals and went out of business in 2001, plus online streaming shit. So pulled the plug on the label then. And by then I was doing the toys. I had a little bit of cash. I was like, fuck it. I'll just concentrate on doing the toys. You know, so it was like this sort of like ride the whole time. Um, and then coming out here, it forced me to get my shit together. It forced me to figure out how to run a business properly, you know, get insurance, be a human, buy a house, all that kind of stuff. So, but I had this really great sort of like, you know, extended adolescence until I was like 30. You know, like my 20s were a fun time because all I did in my 20s was have a good time and like get paid for it. So, you know, and that's why I think the posters have this weird energy because I lived totally, totally in this fantasy bubble of like, of like bands and hot girls and cool bars and like no responsibilities. And so all of my stress energy, you know, I would go see a band, I get really hyped and go do a poster. You know what I'm saying? That kind of a thing. You're, so I think that's why those posters are really special because whatever weird energy was happening in that scene, it came through in the posters. Absolutely. And and what I, the feeling I get when I look at your posters, it's almost like a... I almost feel like I'm watching a trailer looking at the posters because you want to know what the story is, like what right. the characters are, and you know there's more happening here, but you're just looking at an image. And, you know, you don't get that from 99% of other concert posters. Um, My deal was, you know, it's like, you know... I had like personal rules. So number one is like, I, you know, I'm big on like, what's interesting is what, what happened or what's about to happen, right? Nobody really cares about right now, okay? So like in literature, in movies, it's either figuring out a puzzle of the past or looking towards what the surprise of the future. So I sort of took that approach. I'm glad you noticed it in the posters. Number two is most of the bands that I was really into, so like, I would try to do like a poster that was actually the reverse of what anybody else would do for that band, but it still made sense in some fucked up way, right? Like it's really, you know, easy. Like, you know, you have a band called like Hammerhead. So, you know, most people are gonna do like a dude with a hammer for a head or whatever, right? Or a hammer hitting something or whatever the fuck. Well, that's kind of like 
what's the point, right? Or a picture of the band, okay? You know, I would go to try to do like, you know, so kind of like my rules, like if it was like a super fucking heavy band, like some Melvins or whatever, I'd do something that it's really cute, right? Because like, how fucked is that like, wrong, right? You know, and if it was like, kind of like a really mellow, like it's Sebado or whatever, I would do something really fucked, right? And so the bands usually like that because it would be a novel experience for them and they would kind of get, also I would always try to like, if I didn't really know about the band, I would try to listen to them, look at lyrics, think about like the trip, you know, especially if I like them, like where they sent me, you know, like oh, I'm going into outer space because I like this, they sound like Sabbath. And, and I would try to put weird associated imagery that wasn't super obvious punk rock. You know, it's easy, like you could put a dick on everything and oh wow, right? No, but it wouldn't be that. It would be like, I want to infer the dick. I want the dick like not here, but like over here. And you know, there's a dick over there, but you don't know if it's where it's going to go, right? Yeah. So that was all actually really done on purpose, but at the same time, without thinking about it too much, right? Because I was just so fucking immersed in my weird self indulgent trip that it happened in your in your artist discovery and you said you listened to the band when they would you know you would start to work with them and look at the lyrics what was your first impression of bands like nirvana chili peppers okay so nirvana actually sucked and they were just a pop band and um no real underground maybe the first tour right but um like you know i'm kind of an old punk rocker so they were just kind of like okay good looking singer there's that one, one photo of Cobain in the striped sweater where he looks really soulful if they had never taken that picture a band wouldn't be that big okay mm -hmm. so uh, they're just basically a boy band okay like some pretty cool music right but you know nothing that nobody not, nothing that not a million other bands were doing at the same time and doing just as good all right um, so for me like I saw them on the first tour and you know, they were okay. It was cool. They played with a bunch of other bands. They weren't bad. Um, and then they blew up. They became, everyone's like, it's, he's Jesus or whatever the fuck. And then when he died, he's like super Jesus. And I never really got it, you know? And I wasn't that big into grunge anyways. I mean, I did a lot of grunge bands, but who did I like, you know, from the Northwest? I really liked the U men were a good band. And that's probably about it. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, I did, they were cool people and I did a lot of stuff for them. You know, um, my, what I really liked in the eighties was like really fucked up shit. I was really into like live skull and, uh, the butthole surfers and like some of that, gr like grind cork, like God flesh kind of grind corky kind of stuff. Right. Metal, old metal always. Um, but I was also listening to like really weird ethereal shit, like the orb and stuff, right. And orbital, like in the late eight. So kind of a, and like there was a really cool band that never went anywhere from, from Texas called Lithium Christmas. That was a really, really cool, crazy psychedelic band, um, but kind of punk. So for me, you know, Nirvana, it's like um, if they hadn't had the good looking front man, they would have just been like, you know, whatever, like another one of those bands from the Pacific Northwest, you know, yeah. that maybe had like one good song or whatever the fuck. And they're still around. They would have been like, you know, mud honey or somebody. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal. Yeah. How would you decide? Um, like, I know it's not religious. Sorry, kids. But, you know, <laughs> I'm old and cranky and I saw them all. I'm so excited to look up some of these bands you just mentioned that I haven't heard of that sound. The human are fucking awesome, dude. They're like from the mid 80s. They're a total punk rock band from like the university district in Seattle. And I think the human are probably the best band Seattle ever fucking spawned. Yeah. Um, when, it, when it, were good. they were from like Portland, I think. Wait, what was that? What was that band called? Crucifix. I think they were from Portland. They were pretty good too, like raw punk rock band. And they come, they play like backyards on tours. Like it was crazy. Yeah. When a band would approach you to do an album cover, what was your credit? Because that's obviously it's a it's a much bigger. Artistic. I had to like not hate the band. Yeah, I was wondering like what you know how. And in, you know, in the case of the one band that I you know, the big one, the famous one or whatever that I did. Um, like, I like the band okay, and I initially turned it down, and then they offered, like, like, a lot of money. And so I did it, and then 
that's the one album cover that everybody, you know, and I'm glad I did because now everyone was like, I had that record when I was a kid and I loved that album cover. I would freak on it all the time. So that one turned out good. But I mean, mostly, you know, early on, it's kind of like I would only get offered, obviously, weird shit. So if it was weird, I'd be into it, right? I was never really picky about music. I like, if you look at the discography of the label I had, the man's ruling label, like, did all kinds of shit. <clears throat> I appreciated, like, honest effort in the band. You know, so they could actually be fucking horrible. Like, I had one band that I released many records with that were actually really terrible, but the people in the band were so into their trip that I had to respect their effort. And so, like, I would put out their records because I respected them for what they were doing because they were really doing it, like, for real, right? It wasn't like they weren't doing it to get high or get laid or be famous or any of other shit. They were doing it because they had to do it. And even though I didn't like their music at all, I liked the fact of like what they were doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so my cr criteria would be really weird. Getting paid helps, you know, never backwards about getting paid because um, you can be creative and make money too. It's not a sin, you know? In fact, it, I actually think that if you have to make enough money being creative, you get better because you have the freedom to explore and to experiment because you're not, you know, worrying about like paying the gas bill. Did you look at bands you would sign to Man's Ruin as, as an extension of your creativity and see that as, as like you curating? I mean, a little bit, but the way I would do it is, um, I mean, some bands are bands I really liked. Okay. And the reason I actually started the label is that like, I had a lot of friends in bands that were amazing bands, okay? Um, but they were out of fashion at the record labels. Nobody wanted to put out their records or the record labels would, you know, they wanted to produce their music, which I thought was, well, you know, why would you want someone else to produce your music, right? So a, a lot of the uh, initial releases were with people that I knew personally that were frustrated by their situation. They couldn't get a record deal or they had a record deal and they were like trying to make their music into something they didn't want. So I was like, look, I'm going to do this. Like a lot of people talk righteous shit, right? So I was like, I'm going to do this right. Like I had somebody, I'll, I'll do some money, right? So I'm like, here's the deal. It's like, I'll give you X amount of money. You record whatever you want. You produce it. We'll release it. I get to do whatever I want to for the album cover art. If it makes money, will split the profit 50 /50. You keep your publishing. Cleanest deal ever, right? And some bands, like, really rose to the occasion, did phenomenal shit. We sold a ton of records. Other bands, so, you know, you could get different experiences, right? But for me, the thing with the label was more like, number one is I wanted to do it, like, like for real, the way you're supposed to do punk rock stuff, right? Number one. And number two is the way I would pick bands that I didn't know is I would go in... Let everything pile up. We get hundreds, we get hundreds of submissions a week, especially when like Kerrang and shit started like reviewing our records. Um, and like Rolling Stone was reviewing our records. We're like this little label, and like Rolling Stone was reviewing us. It was crazy. Okay. Um, so I would go every Saturday when nobody else was around because I had employees and stuff. And I would just sit there and I would just. It was all like, you know, 100% cassettes at first, and then we started getting CDs. And I would just like not even really look at the packaging material, right? I would just like, you know, pile up all the CDs and start playing them. And I would play, you know, like first song, second song, something towards the end of the tape. Just uh, listen to part of it. And if it, if it like, right, if I felt a reaction, like, whoa, that's really cool or that's interesting. I've set that one aside. If I didn't get an immediate, like, you know, reaction, I'm not going to do it. Okay. It was that basic. Like, it, kind of like it either rocked or it didn't. Like that, right? Just really judgmental. Now, sounds snobby, but you got to remember, like, I saw, like, maybe, like, 10,000 live performances in Austin yeah. over the years. Three, four bands a night, every night. Like, literally, six days a week, seven days a week. So, kind of like, I'd kind of seen, like, every kind of possible thing fucking thing ever, you know, on stage, right? So I kind of had new, kind of knew a little bit about, you know, like if I, if, a, if somebody had like 
something or not. You know, naturally you make mistakes, my own, because that's what usually when I would like, the mistakes were usually when it was like a buddy, right? Or like, you know, like, oh, one of my employees really likes this band, so okay, cool, they can have their pick, you know, this month. Um, but most stuff was just that basic, like, and it, sometimes they were known bands and sometimes they were unknown bands. But it was just like, did it grab me by the, you know, did it rock or not? Like real, it was very impulsive. And I would plow through like 200 cassettes a weekend that way. And, you know, maybe pick like five or 10 bands. We did a lot of it. It goes to show you how important like album sequencing is. And, yeah. how and I didn't care. Like well, the one thing I learned is like the nicer the package, like if it came and it like unfolded and like had lights and like a tip came, you know, they always sucked. <laughs> but if it was something that came like a fucking shitty cassette that had been taped over in an envelope, half the time it fucking ruled because the energy was going in the music, not the presentation. Yeah. Because you can always groom the presentation later. If you don't have the basic, it rocks, you're fucked, you know? I feel like that's the case with anything. The more selling you have to do of it, the, the shittier the product probably is. Um, so one, uh, back to the, the concert posters, one thing we're seeing now, obviously with all these protests going on right now, is people, a lot of designers making signs. Um, what do you think makes an effective sign or poster to, I know you said you don't have a message, but to convey something or make somebody feel something like what is the perfect sign? It has to be very, very simple. Okay. It has to be legible in a sea of other signs or advertisements. So bold, simple, bold. Okay. Two words or a word in an image are always going to be the best. No one wants to read a big long sentence on a sign, yeah. especially when that sign is surrounded by like a million others. You know what I'm saying? Size yeah. doesn't matter. You know, uh, you know, if you have the luxury of knowing like the market for your sign, like it's going to go here or going to appear at the, you know, you think about it for a minute and go, okay, it's going to be a protest sign. What do most protest signs look like? I'll do something that looks different. That's really, really simple and really bold. That'll stand out, okay? Um, and then on the toy side, were toys always something you played with growing up or did you, was this like- Yeah, you know, it's like, um, not so much toys. I was really into models my whole life. Right? Okay. So when I was a kid, I got really good at building models. And then as an adult, I would scratch build models and I would build in Texas, you know, I would build crazy models. I got into like RC airplanes for a while, you know? So, and I really, you know, I really like things. So like, I always collected like weird things, right? Like furniture or lamps or whatever. And so it's like, and I would always sort of think of, you know, when I, when I buy a thing, I try to think about like, well, who designed this? Where was it made? And I like, try to visualize it. So I sort of have a, that sort of fascination, like a historical fascination. So. When I was, you know, a kid and coming up and I was like, you know, no way to go to school or anything. And, but I would like get like how to illustrate books. And like, I remember there was like some kind of fancy, I would get like the face or whatever, or ID, these sort of like designery magazines. And there was a company called Frog Design that made like shit like, a, you know, blenders and vacuum cleaners, but they were really, really advanced and really cool, right? And they'd be like, well, it'd be so cool to be able to design objects right so i don't even know where i started with this this thing but it's like what was the question original question just like what kind of toys you played with or, or yeah so i never played with toys but i was always interested in like banking things right and learning how stuff is made so my trip with the toys is more like fascinated with the process and the end results and the packaging and so it's kind of like a poster but it's three-dimensional right and it's sort of like interesting and exciting and it has the successful toys or objects that they now they have a life of their own you know like what the poster the poster is like if you get a poster i mean it means something to somebody sometimes they went to the show or they like the band order but it's pretty much like the poster is a poster it's this thing that's just in the wall it kind of doesn't have a life an exterior you know objects have a life they they outlast owners, they, they travel around. The toys 
people make pets of them. Like I get mail from people. Like I took my lab to the South Pole, right? Here's no, seriously, dude. You know, here's your lab and on top of Mount Everest, you know, weird shit like that happens, right? Where it's like people take these little, you know, these little, little avatar things, right? And they, uh, they make, they're like a reflection of them. It's like this thing becomes a reflection of them and it, it goes on their journeys with them. And it, so what's really interesting about the toys is you can, if, uh, if you do a successful toy, um, it actually becomes really important to like a certain amount of people, like, like a pet or another person is. And that's really interesting. You know, I mean, I do it. I fetishize my objects, right? So the, the, the fact that I can make a design for an object that not only gets highly absorbed by humans in our culture, but in other cultures too, is really intriguing and and it's i don't even i i, I don't know if, I, if i'm proud of it or i don't know what the word is but it's just like it's kind of like really interesting and weird and i feel lucky to be able to have that ability to communicate basic concepts because in art and communication basic concepts are super key and it's really hard to do you know it's easy to draw something ultra tweaky and complex and wow it's so complicated that's cool it's super hard to draw like some ultra symbol that works, right? So kind of my trip with the toys is doing something that's like really, really, really simple, but that it can like turn into like almost anything an observer wants it to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of like yeah. a mind fuck puzzle. So that, where, that, did the, where did the labbit come from? What, what, the first time you drew that or designed it? What, what it's was a that pretty good story. So, you know, I told you about Japan, right? So. Mm -hmm. I was going to Japan and I was hanging out with these like really, really high end, really rich, you know, fashion people, you know, this older generation, these guys, these are guys that are like, you know, super wealthy. All right. And they're the, all the string pullers of the younger generation in the nineties. And so they had this preconceived notion of what an artist was and what I was. And I went over there and they got really surprised because I was really obsessed with Hello Kitty in the 90s, right? I collected the Hello Kitty stuff, Kurobi, I don't know, it, just, it was really perfect, it was really cool. So I go over there and they're like, so what do you want to do, artist man, you know? So, you know, they were expecting me to, like, I want like eight hookers and I wanted them to carry me at Mount Fuji while they feed me shrimp or whatever the fuck they thought, you know, would be cool. And I was like, I want to go to Puro Land, which is like the sh shitty Hello Kitty theme park in Japan, right? And they were all just like, are you what are you a pedophile are you insane like and so they explained to me like in japan hello kitty is like only for kids it's it's what was like white trash wherever it passes for white trash in japan it was like beanie baby or something it was like this like super shitty thing and i was like no you don't understand from our perspective it's like really interesting and really pure it's like sort of sat down and like gave them this bizarre education and this you know like which they already knew but like they had never their perspective was so skewed, they could they saw it as crap, right? Where I was like, no, actually, it's really genius, and here's why. She has no mouth, but yet she speaks. So, and they're like, whoa, that's really interesting. And I then I started riffing, and they're like, well, you should maybe design your own character, right? So we were like in I don't know, a fucking restaurant or a bar. I'm like, yeah, maybe Hello Kitty has like like this dude that she booty calls when like you know, dear Daniel, because he's got like a little dick, and so she has like this sort of thuggy guy she booty calls at three in the morning. So, so I drew this like little lumpy rabbit with like, you know, he's all dirty. He was like smoking. Right. And he was like, go over there and fuck the shit out of her bar 20 bucks and split. Right. Kind of guy. Right. So it was like, hello kitty's like dirty booty call guy. And that was the idea behind Labbit. And they're like, Oh, that's actually kind of funny. We like that. Okay. You should make a character. So then that's what Labbit started out as is basically was the sort of sleazy hot guy that you can't trust, but, will fuck the shit out of you at three in the morning when you need him to, but just don't, don't expect him to do anything else, right? So that was always the- Never gonna look at Hello Kitty the same way. <laughs> right, so that was kind of like always the uh, the deal. I still have the beer coaster thing. And then, you know, and originally it was supposed to be like, you know, smoking rabbits, but then when we made the first Bounty Hunter toy, the fucking factory totally did the Chinglish thing and the packaging came back smorking rabbit which was like so much more genius, right? Than anything I could think of. I was like, okay, fuck it, I'm changing the name. So the name was actually invented by some dude in China that like 
didn't that shinglish the fuck out of the packaging. So kind of like you know, the lab is a special feel good and heartwarming story, bro, on every level. I so it was like people. a collision between American asshole and like confused Asian people. And I love that it goes back to what you said before, like everything by accident and just like a perfect collision of, <laughs> you know, that's, that's amazing. Um, I think the first, I think that was in 97 that that happened. And like, I started out, I made like, I actually made these resin ones early on that are long gone. I've got one. Um, they all sold in Japan. And then I made like, I would make like glass ashtrays in Mexico with the rabbit and I made Zippos and I would sell the ashtray and the rabbit as a set in a silk cream box. Wow. I did, you know, the, the resin rabbits, I, I had printed a lot, like plastic lunch boxes and packed them with like Easter egg shit, right? And like the little smoking rabbit in there, he's about that big. So I actually sold, was selling the rabbit, the rabbit merchandise in the 90s before the toy thing ever happened, but everybody liked it. So when it came time to do the toy, the guy Hikaru and Bounty Hunter wanted to do the lab as a toy. So that was actually, the first vinyl toy I did, and it would have released in, I think, early 99. So I think Cause and I, I might have been the first, or he might have been the first, but one of us was the first American dude to make a vinyl toy. Mine might have been first, I think he did his first one with Medicom. I'm not really quite sure. Uh, so, you know, and he's done really well for himself, right? He, he, he did that great big, that great big fiberglass Michelin man piece that went on the beautiful losers tour and that like bumped him up into like credible art land. And so, you know, whatever he's making billions. So good for him. Um, you know, it didn't happen to me. We should have, but it didn't. Um, I tried, <laughs> but that's kind of like where it started. Yeah. So I've been okay with myself. I can't complain. One thing I wanted to talk to you about is this like evolution of artist merch where I feel like, you know, when you were back in Austin, they, they sold t-shirts and, and albums at shows. Now we see, and I think it's a product of, of streaming and like dwindling album sales that artists are having to make more and more things to supplement. Um, but you see artists doing these drops where they'll drop their album with like a 60 piece merch drop with like, toys and super soakers and shoes. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I had a big one, when, when, you know, when, uh, when the whole, like, music should be free on the internet movement started off in 2000, 2001. I was the one guy. I went to a bunch of conferences. I was the one hated guy that's like, not a good idea. How are the bands going to get paid? This is going to fuck the bands. And they're like, ah, oh, fuck you. You own a label. You're just ripping off the bands anyways. Music should be free, man. I'm like, okay. And so, yeah, you're a band now. Unless you can tour all the time or sell a ton of merch, what are you gonna do, work at Subway? And like get paid like 10 cents from Spotify or whatever, you know, for selling a million songs? Like the online music thing is a fucking total ripoff and it's fucked so many bands, so many labels, so many producers, unfucking real. So also the other thing too is that before, I'm gonna blame everything on the internet, okay? Before the internet, you had to fucking go to shows. Okay, you had to buy a record. You had to be a part of a physical experience. You had to know other fans in other towns, right? You had to be part of like an interconnected actual thing that required actual human beings moving things around and doing things, okay? Now it's like, you know, I haven't bought a record. I don't know. I just go to YouTube. I'm an asshole. I just go to YouTube and like do a playlist and like listen to it all day long, okay? I haven't bought a record in years. I'm part of the problem. Internet fucked all that. So yeah, if you want to be a recording artist, you're not going to make any money off your music. You're going to make money off lifestyle. Okay, so what do you have to sell? You can't, you're not really selling the music, okay, that much. You're selling the fancy of a lifestyle that the music brings to you, okay? So like, especially if you're like, you know, rap, R&B, whatever you, you want to call it these days, right? It's all about this lifestyle. Like, you're going to be this rich, famous musician. Well, the only way you can be a rich, famous mu musician is to be able to sell crap to people. And since you're not getting paid for the music, you got to get paid from something, right? So these guys are super successful. They've done that. They've like elaborately, like, you know, curated collections of consumer goods that they've been able to leverage up in the value system, you know, taking advantage of online hype 
to make it worthwhile. You know, a pair of them fucking Yeezys, man, cost whatever, $8 to make a pair. Like, there's no reason they should be like whatever they cost, a thousand bucks, right? It's only because this dude that has successfully played the game, you know, you want to be like, I got Yeezys, man. I'm, someday I will go eat banana pudding with fucking Kanye in his mansion and we'll be wearing robes or whatever. No, dude, you're just going to like give him a lot of money. You're fucking stupid. You know? You're getting a pair of tennis shoes, like relax. So, but that's how the world works. It's been that way since like, you know, the first two tribes of cavemen collided somewhere like, whoa, those dudes have like shinier stones, you know. But I think the reality of it is, it is yes, it's, it's the internet age. And so it's like, um, you know, because a dream isn't like, you know, I mean, no one's writing like, epic songs anymore. Like, where's the epic protest song for the last 10 days? It doesn't exist. Right. Like, there's no, you know, fucking Neil, you know, there's no like, you know, I hate to say it, man, but, you know, big mainstream music is like, you know, it's just, uh, it just, there's 50 dudes writing a two line song. It's crazy. Where is the singer songwriters? That time is over for a while or forever, maybe. So, the new genius now is creating this entire thing where, you know, if someone's smart, because there's all these sort of like dudes that, you know, we've never heard of. I get hit up by them all the time for a kid robot. Guy's got 40 million in, you know, followers on Instagram and he makes like $20 million a year as a DJ. And I've never heard of the guy, but he's got all these people fucking in Israel or whatever love him and he can sell tons of merch. So, if you're a smart, cunning person and have good management and can do math, yeah, the music's going to be the least of it anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, you guys could drop a record. You know? as a, you know, So you could, like, you know, I'm DJ, you know, Token Pharaoh or whatever, you know, or, like, fucking, you know, yeah. you, know D, you know, DJ, you know, like, Moonweed and, and, like, you know, here's my chill mix and here's, and people are going to buy the clothes and you're not gonna sell any records right um last question i don't want to take up too much of your time but I'm too simple, maybe. what's next for you you you've done so many different things what do you is there anything you, you know it's you like you know you think i would retired by now right but it's just like um i'm not the kind of person that can just watch television um what's next for me you know i'm building a big creative team of people that now is doing work for two companies. That's interesting, right? So I'm sort of running this whole creative outfit. Um, and it, you know, it's, I get paid well, it's nice. Um, I'm still doing my own weird shit. I'm doing, you know, weird toys in Japan, like your pig toy that you guys are gonna carry. I just did a deal to do like three years with like crazy art prints with a guy. Um, you know, so just more weird shit. Um, I'm loving the lockdown because like I'm doing getting tons of shit done, uh, both in the art world and like, you know, fixing up my house and shit. Um, I'm happy to see all the riots and protests, you know, cause you know, it's, you know, there's Trump has finally fucking been so stupid that he's got to get voted out now at this point. So that's good. You know, the pandemic's weird, but I don't know. So it's like, what's next? I think more of the same. I, you know, I hope to be able to do it. I hope to stay healthy. I mean, I'm 59. So, you know, if I got another 10 or 15 years of functionality, I'll be stoked. It, then I would have had a 50-year career in the, you know, wow. underground or whatever. I mean, this was weird, dude. I've been doing this for like a, 35 years now. And I'm still selling weird shit to new young people. That's a, I think that's a pretty interesting position to be in. That means that like, you know, like um, maybe I still got something of interest for the world. Most people I know my age, like, you know, they're just fucking watching TV or whatever, right? So. Um, I think that's what's inspiring to me. About you know, for, I mean, to me, the whole thing is a big project. Like I, I want to be able to do interesting stuff until the day I die. Yeah. So does that make sense? For sure. And I think the only thing I haven't done is like write poetry or do dance or something. I don't know. I've done everything else. You're not so I'll just keep doing whatever crazy shit occurs to me or it gets offered to me. 
Yeah, that, what I was going to say is I think that's what's <coughs> sculpting. Really I might be. I'm kind of getting really interested in like actually doing physical sculpture huh. again. So I might start doing some weird sculpting, whether with clay and hand tools or like with a digital program. I don't know, but I think that's something that I I think about more and more lately. So that might be something new that I might like, you know, do some, I mean, I've done it before, but maybe, so it's not exactly new, but maybe um, more like one off pieces, like in a traditional format or something. I don't know. That's tight. If, if anybody wants them. You know. I'm, sh I'm sure you won't have a problem placing those. Uh, yeah, I mean, your, your ability to grow and adapt, but also still like stay ahead while using like mediums that have really have been around forever is is what i find fascinating and uh, yeah i'm always excited to see what you make i'm so excited for us to put this collab out and uh well it's nice to hear that you guys are doing good because i was kind of fuck man you know I, I was thinking about this like okay like what happens to streetwear when there's no street right like yeah. do people still buy it and like just go on TikTok, you know, like what, where, where do you see people showing off your goods now? I think you nailed it. Um, yeah. I mean, and I know some, some brands have struggled in this time, but uh, without going too deep into it, like I think we're having our best year ever. Fuck. That rule, dude. That's yeah. really good. And yeah. whether that's, whether that's, uh, you know, from, people just like having a little more money to spend or being home, or I think we've worked on some of our coolest projects this year, um, between Kozik, Kubrick, um, we just did. What time does that clockwork orange thing go live? Tonight. Uh, okay, midnight or? 9 p.m. Pacific. Okay, I'll, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, some of the, some of the, uh, like the quilted bomber jacket that looks like the straight jacket is crazy. How much are those? Um, I want to say it's going to be like 129 or 140, something like that. Oh, that's not bad. Okay. Um, yeah, all the cut and sew stuff from Clockwork is crazy. All the patterns are pulled like, like there's a, a patterned all over print t-shirt with um, this crazy black and white spiral design. Um, and I was wondering like, where where did that come from? And then I watched the movie, and it's the paint job on the ceiling of the record store when he goes and meets those two girls with the lollipop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just like little subtle things that that Bobby pulled from the movie that really just jump out and and made it special. So I'm really excited about this one, and uh, yeah. So I appreciate you taking the time, Frank. All right, and you saw him that I know that. I know we stressed it on the prints, so like I just, they're all signed. I just gotta like put them on a thing and like wheel them over to the post office about a mile away. So I just, I haven't, I haven't dealt with it yet. So. Cool. We're not tripping. We appreciate it. Thanks, okay. man. All right. We'll talk Later. to you.